Sometimes stents are necessary for this treatment, although they are not designed for the internal jugular vein. I've asked Ivo Petrov to give us his experience with the use of stents in this treatment. Friends, first of all, allow me to thank you, Dr. Sklafani, for the invitation. It's really my pleasure to be here among you. Uh, the Gary's presentation was fantastic, and uh, it's easier for me to to mm, have the presentation about stenting because one of the maybe uh, main indications for stenting in this patient is the repeated procedure after restenosis. Uh, I'm coming from Bulgaria. It's a small country in the Southeast Europe, just above Greece. Here. Several nice pictures from my country. And uh, okay, this is our Japanese hospital in Sofia. So, but it's another story. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, the biggest part of the audience is uh, uh, convinced that there is a very close relationship between the CCSVI and multiple sclerosis. And uh, they are, we are gathering many and many data that uh, there is also a very close relationship between the vascular result and also the clinical result. Uh, maybe the biggest problem uh, since the pioneering work uh, of uh, Dr. Zamboni is really the restenosis. Uh, it's uh, in our proper work, it's uh, the incidence is 32% and in the work of Dr. Zamboni, it reached 47% uh, into jugular, jugular region. Into the azygous region is, uh, is less. And uh, really the main question is to find the best way to restore and to, uh, to maintain the, the restored uh, venous flow in these patients in order to, to have the good uh, clinical result. One of the strategies preventing restenosis, maybe the most logic, is uh, routine stenting. If we extrapolate the data from the uh, iliac and the vena cava, uh, but uh, also it carries the risk of late uh, rethrombosis. That is the, the biggest complication, late complication of routine stenting. And um, mm, we are trying always to, to do an optimal balloon angioplasty. So we are not uh, very keen to stent every patient routinely, but we have uh, several elective and bailout indications. Among the elective indications, uh, there are the so-called undilatable lesions that cannot be dilated with cutting balloon or uh, scoring wires and so on. Uh, also a fast and very severe lesion recoil and also twisting. The twisting is uh, uh, more typical for the azygos and uh, the severe target lesion wrist and all this and three occlusion as uh, Gary uh, has shown. The main bailout indications are the flow limited dissection and the vessel rupture. Uh, in our group of uh, 948 patients treated until now and in, uh, we treated 2,198 veins in this patient's group and we implanted 108 stents. So the mean rate of stenting is 4.9% uh, of all the treated lesions, so it's not big. Uh, we implanted, it's very uh, important to emphasize that we are implanting only self-expandable nitinol stents. I think it's important because the, the vein is very dynamic. It uh, collapses, it opens, it collapses, it opens, and uh, the balloon expandable stent is uh, not a good choice. You maybe know that uh, one of, of the first migrations of the stents was uh, uh, a patient done with uh, balloon expandable stent. We implanted mainly the Protege EV3 uh, that I'm using routinely for carotids and several Astron Biotronic stent, a German company. It's also nitinol with uh, silicon carbide coverage. Uh, what about the vessel region? Uh, uh, we are implant, uh, the, the rate of implantation is a little bigger into the jugular uh, uh, vessel area and a little less uh, into the azygos. Into the left uh, jugular uh, vein, uh, the diameter of the stent implanted uh, 
is a little less than into the right and uh, it's a little smaller, even smaller into the azigos vein. Uh, what about the safety profile? I would say that the safety profile of stenting is very similar to the balloon angioplasty. Uh, we don't have to expect any special about safety. We didn't have no one big complication. We had three acute stent thrombosis. In, uh, uh, in one of the, of the patients, it was uh, very interesting. Uh, she had uh, very deep scissors, uh, uh, scissors, uh, how is uh, uh, cramp, spasm, spasm of the, of the muscles uh, during the, the primary procedure. And after stenting her, they disappeared immediately. And two hours later, the spasm appeared again. And uh, okay, I decided to take a look at uh, the vein with the Doppler. At in, uh, in the Doppler, the uh, huge thrombus was seen into the stent. Uh, it was very easy to reconalize and to make uh, fibrinolysis. And with uh, optimization with balloon angioplasty, uh, she did uh, quite, quite well. Uh, what about the minor events? They are not so minor sometimes because the compartment syndrome uh, in a couple of patients uh, we had uh, quite a deep neck and uh, shoulder pain. This is uh, in fact uh, accessory nerve neuritis and uh, in one of the patients it lasted 14 weeks. Very young patient, uh, he's uh, 20, year, uh, 20 years now but uh, in the beginning it was uh, really a very bad situation. After it, it, it went and uh, he's in a perfect physical condition now. And fortunately also the headache and neck uh, pain uh, disappeared. In four patients we had mild fever, but I have to mention that in two of them uh, it was a combined treatment of stem cells implantation and stenting, so I don't believe it's related to, to the stent itself. Um, what about restenosis rethrombosis? I mentioned this can be a significant problem in stenting. Uh, we had uh, five patients uh, with rethrombosis into the follow-up, and uh, three of them were successfully re reconalized, but uh, as uh, Gary mentioned, not always is possible to reconalize a stent that is full of thrombus and fibrotic material, so not always is uh, uh, possible even using uh, a technique for reconalization of coronary or peripheral, uh, peripheral occlusion, so quite aggressive materials, not always is, is possible. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, the combined uh, risk stenosis rethrombosis rate is not very high, so it's 6.4, much less than the risk stenosis after balloon angioplasty. Uh, what about the, the medication protocol? It's quite important. Uh, you are going to see why. Uh, our protocol after the procedure is uh, 800 to 1,000 uh, units of heparin uh, overnight, depending on the APTT. And uh, we are using uh, our protocol in the last months uh, is uh, the direct antithrombin, dabigatran. It's anticoagulant. That is a direct anticoagulant, uh, not like the warfarin that is indirect. And the dose is quite low. So it's, uh, let's say, in women, in uh, most of the uh, female patients, I'm using two times uh, 75 milligrams per day. And in uh, male population, I'm using uh, uh, bid uh, uh, 110 milligrams for six months in stented patients. And uh, it's important to mention that most of the thrombosis cases occur during the initial period when we, uh, we were using aspirin and Plavix. Plavix uh, extrapolating the data from the arterial field, but uh, evidently the Plavix, the clopidogrel doesn't work in the, in the veins. It's a uh, different flow and so much. Several uh, challenging cases done with stenting. Here is a um, dissection. Not very big, but it was one of the, of the initial cases. Uh, when we saw uh, this picture, we were uh, scared that we uh, harmed a lot the vein. I know now that it's not true, but uh, nevertheless, uh, after seeing this picture, we decided to stand. So this is the stent implantation, the protege, 10 millimeter, and uh, with a quite a good, nice result the dissection disappeared totally, the flow is nice, uh, 
in fact, uh, for me, uh, something like a timid tree flow into the coronaries, into the veins, it's important the, the vein to be, uh, to, be uh, to have the flow in one heart cycle. So if we, if we inject contrast into the distal part of the vein, if in one cycle the, uh, the vein is empty, this is a good flow. This is something like a timid tree flow into the coronaries. Uh, another very young patient, uh, she's my relative, 19 year old girl. She had two MS attacks uh, with uh, multiple plaque of, of demyelinization, more than 30 plaque of demyelinization. And uh, he had a uh, headache, uh, um, unbearable headache and sleeping disorder. And uh, she decreased in the time, the walking distance. And she had also balance uh, disorder, very deep bal balance disorder. She had critical left internal jugular vein stenosis. In our, uh, in our practice, the left jugular vein is uh, mostly, in most of the, the cases, is stenosed. And it's smaller. It's a little smaller than the, than the right. This is the Doppler finding. You see there is a thickened wall. Uh, what uh, Sal have shown into the iris many times is seen into the Doppler, into the transcutaneous Doppler. So it's a very thickened wall of the vein and uh, very stenosed uh, lumen at the, at the place of the thickened wall. And also a reflux. You see that uh, there is a, a true and, fr and fro. And uh, this is the same. A reflux and uh, we, we saw quite a hypoplastic vein uh, uh, that was not possible to be dilated with balloons with uh, a very, very resistant stenosis in the middle segment. And after stenting, we are you are going to see that uh, uh, even after stenting and after aggressive balloon dilation, the stent remained uh, with a waste, a little compressed by this thickened wall of, of the vein. Uh, it was very, uh, she, she had a very good clinical result. Now she's uh, still uh, swimming, uh, doing tennis, uh, no headache, no sleeping disorder. The most uh, interesting thing uh, was that uh, this tent that was compressed during the initial procedure, dilated by himself. So it opened totally, no constraints, no waste, with a perfect, uh, perfect uh, flow. So uh, this stent had uh, positive stent remodeling. It was uh, very nice. So uh, this is an another case with uh, distal uh, total occlusion of the, of the left jugular vein. This is not an occlusion. This is uh, the valve. Uh, the valve has to be crossed with the wire. And after the crossing, uh, crossing the, the valve, we saw a total distal total occlusion just below the bulb just below the bulb and uh, using coronary wires, uh, Asahi Miracle wire that we are using for the coronary chronic occlusions. Uh, we succeeded uh, to recanalize and after using uh, small balloons, after that a little bigger balloons, we succeeded to open the, the vein and after the stent implantation, you see how fast the vein is emptied. In one heart cycle, it's, it's emptied. This is another challenging case. This is the last one. Uh, Inominate vein uh, total occlusion. The patient, uh, young patient, 33 years uh, old patient with uh, EDSS score of 5.5. Uh, and uh, again, using uh, a coronary CTO technique with uh, O14 wire, I succeeded to, to reopen it. Uh, you are going to see it's uh, quite interesting after the partial recanalization there was uh, uh, huge collaterals uh, were seen and after the stenting of the innominate, the uh, normal flow was absolutely restored with total disappearance of the collaterals. Uh, this is the last case. It's a case of a very constrained stent. You see, this is just below the stent. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. But uh, we used uh, uh, angioscope. They are scoring balloons at 22 atmospheres, uh, kissing, kissing scoring balloons in order to, to overcome this uh, very tight stenosis just below the stent. And this is very important. I'm going to show you why. 
after opening the stent uh, and uh, the stenosis below the stent, uh, the evolution uh, was, uh, was good and the normal flow is very important in stenting. What I have learned about stenting. If mandatory to implant a stent into a vein, we have to fully dilate and restore the flow in all the lesions in the stented vein, not only in one lesion. So we have to, to have uh, 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 beneficial runoff in order to maintain the good stented, uh, stent result. The highly resistant stenosis can be usually successfully treated with non-compliant scoring or cutting balloons and a strict post-procedure anticoagulation regime rather than antiplated is uh, mandatory. Uh, what we need, maybe for optimization of the, of the late results, we need uh, an ideal stent. It doesn't exist uh, yet. Uh, for me, it has to be self-expandable for optimal apposition and migration prevention. It has to be thrombus resistant, very important. He had, uh, has to have high radial force for non-dilatable lesions, uh, as I have shown. Uh, he has to be highly flexible and biodegradable in order to prevent compartment syndrome and late thrombosis. And he has to have hybrid design to follow better the complex vein anatomy because the vein is not a tube. So thank you for your attention.